bum, bum. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Man, there is a buzz in the house today. Listen to everybody. Yeah, this is pretty exciting stuff. Wow, good stuff. Let's see if I can stress you out a little bit, see if I can worry you a little. Boo. You know, last week we started a series <laughs> entitled Worry. They're, they're going crazy over there. <laughs> last week we started a series entitled Worry. And, and, and today, basically what we're doing is we're, we're taking a look at what did Jesus have to say about worry. And it's interesting because when we really think about it, it's interesting that Jesus would even mention worry, right? I mean, it's just one of those things just that seem to be a part of our lives in every, every moment, not in every day, but like in every moment type of situation. But it's because of worry, and we're, we're going to get a chance to kind of dive into this just a little bit, but it's because of worry that oftentimes our hearts kind of move away from what it is that we ought to be devoted to. So today, we're, we're in the second part of this series, but before we get started, let me just say this. I love you guys. I absolutely positively love you guys. This, this, this week has just been, my phone has just been off the hook. You know, I've been sending out the text. Those of you that get my text, there's about 100 of you, 100 of you that get my text. If you don't get my text, then fill out the little uh, connection card that's inside of the bulletin, or the, yeah, the bulletin there. Just fill it out and put your phone number and then put text. Give me your name because that, that helps because then, if not, then I have to text you and say, who is this? But I'd love to send you the text about the message and, you know, about the message that we just finished and the messages that are coming up. But this week, as I'm sending out the text and stuff, it was interesting because most of you, you would, well, many of you would begin to respond back and kind of let me know a few things. And some of you even sent me some interesting pictures. So this week, as I was sitting there and, and just minding my own business, all of a sudden I get this picture. So I want to show you this picture that somebody gave, gave me. Let, let's take a look at that. You see that there? In, now, it's hard to find out what it is because underneath the caption says, everyone needs a pair of these. So let's see if we can zoom in on what it is that he's saying there. Worry-free pants. That's what we need, right? So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. I got my worry-free pants on, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, and, and there's going to be no worries in the building whatsoever. Now, here's what I want to make sure, and I'm going to try to stress you out from the very beginning. We're going to take a look because many of you have responded back to me and said, said man, what, do, what exactly does it mean to worry? Can you just define worry? Because there's like this thing between worry and concern, right? Well, I'm really concerned about it, but I'm not worried about it. Well, here's the here's the let me give you the bad news first. The bad news is when I went to the dictionary and I started to look it up to try to figure out, okay, what is worry? And then I looked up to see what is concern because I was really hoping, I'm like you, I was hoping there was a difference, right, between worry and concern. That concern was something that was like a powerful, yeah, everything's good, and worry was bad and you're not supposed to do that. So that I could kind of take all of my worry stuff and I could pick it up and then put it in the concern bucket and I would feel better about the things that I feel. But the problem was, whenever I looked it up, truthfully, concern says to mean to, to worry. So then you go to look at worry, and, and, and this is what it says. Let me, let me just give you the definition real quick. To torment oneself with or suffer from disturbing thoughts to fret. And, and in England, like if you were to use the word, because, you know, they, they've got different words for different th than we do, right? So if you were to use the word worry, you know, to worry someone, then this is what you're actually saying, to, to, to harass by tearing, biting, or snapping, especially at the throat. <laughs> now, 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 I don't know about you. <laughs> That sounds like worry to me, <laughs> but, but it sounds like something I do to myself, right? I mean, it's like, I just intense, I don't know. So anyway, I, I, for you, I did this. Okay, really, it was for me. I, I tried to figure out, in today's language, in the way we use our thoughts and the way we do things, because I really believe that it's a good thing to be concerned about something. So we're going to redefine this. Is that okay with everybody? Is that, I mean, well, it doesn't really matter what you think anyway, because I'm going to do it. But, but concern, listen, listen, listen. This is, to be concerned about something is to see the way things are going, to put a voice to it, and then to even get involved to make sure that it turns out for the positive. That, that, that would be to be concerned, okay? So let, let's just kind of put that into a bottle, and that's what we're going to say. To worry is to fear it won't turn out, at least not turn out well, and then letting that fear dominate you to the place of inaction. Concern moves you to action. Worry paralyzes you. 
And and if we're honest, that's where a lot of us are. Whenever we're worried about something, we feel a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. I can't change this. I have no idea what to do. And somehow in our minds, we kind of think that if I worry about it, then maybe somehow there'll be like this energy that'll be sent from me to the thing and it'll change. And that never works, right? It It just doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. So today, like I said, we're in the second part of this particular series. And what I want to do is I want to go back and I I want to revisit some of the things we talked about last week. So let's start out by reading the verse that we took a look at. Uh, This is Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. Now this is Jesus speaking, right? And this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus looking at this group of people who have all gathered, who are there. And he he, he begins to teach them some very uh, applicable things to their lives. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon or God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life, is not life more important than food and body more important than clothes? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store up in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You are much more valuable than they. Verse 27, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to their life? Now, let let me just real quickly, we're going to go through four things, four things that we discovered last week, four things that that I think, you know, everybody across the board, this is one of those things that just kind of applies to you. The first thing is that everybody worries. This isn't an American thing. This isn't a modern thing. This is one of those things that everybody does. Everybody worries. Maybe not at the same level that other people. And, and, and really, that's our problem, is that oftentimes we know somebody in our lives who are like hyper-worriers, right? They're, they're like worriers on steroids. And every time you get around them and you just mention something, they're worried about it now. And they're so stressed and so struggling with the, with, with the situation. So then whenever you look at them and you say, well, I'm not that... And you kind of think, okay, that's not me, so therefore I'm okay. But the truth is is that everybody worries. In one way or another, you may not worry to the extent of somebody else, but you do worry. And in our society, we are raised to worry. As a matter of fact, listen to this. You're not considered a real adult if you don't worry. Right? Do you remember, listen, do you remember whenever you were a kid or maybe now as you're a parent and you're looking at your kids and you say, you know what? You better start thinking about your future. You know what the translation was? You better start worrying about your future. I mean, that, that's basically because the truth is, the truth is they may be telling you to think about it, plan, do all the things that you're supposed to be doing. But what mom and dad are doing is they're saying, I'm really worried about your future. <laughs> it keeps me up at night and I'm struggling with this and I don't see, it doesn't seem like you're worried about it. So I want you to begin to worry about it. So what we've, what we've done to our kids and what we've done to ourselves is we've taught ourselves that this is what it takes, that if you really, really care about something in your life, Life. If you really care about your life, then you will worry about it. And then what we do is we take those practices that our parents teach us and we turn back around and we teach them to our own kids. And not only do we, do we teach them how to worry, but we teach them how not, not just to master worry, but we teach them how to mask it, right? Come on, let's just be honest. In the room, we've learned how to mask our worry. We pick it up and put it in the concern bucket, Right? And, and, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying, to, trying to downplay the concern. I'm just saying that oftentimes many of the things that we call concern are things that we're actually pretty stressed out about. And it, it's fret. And it's, it, it's killing us inside. And it's, it's starting to hurt us. So that's the number one. Number two is that our, our worries reveal something about us. In other words, it is a window into the psyche of our lives. It is a window into the soul. It is a window into the things that we consider being very important. It was interesting reading your text this week. And, and I, I'm, I'm not going to just pick on you. It's me too. This week as people would text me and say, because I, I asked you, okay, so how's the worry watch? How are things going? What's going on? You know, or what, what things are you discovering? And people would begin to write back to me and say, well, you know what? I'm learning this. And oh my goodness. Wow. I didn't even think that I, I, I didn't realize that this thing was, was something that I really worried about, that I really focused in on. And, it, and it's interesting, even looking at it in my life. All this week, and, and a couple of times, my wife just had to remind me. She looked over and said, is, is, is that worry? 
that, that you're doing there? You know, Sunday afternoon, we're, we're driving away, and I looked over, and I said, so how did that go? Yeah, it went fine. No, how did it go? He goes, are you worried about it? I, I guess I am. I guess I, I, I mean, honestly, because her it went fine wasn't enough for me. I, I, wanted to, I wanted you to go a little bit deeper. I wanted you to explain a little bit more. I wanted, you to know, I wanted to know what it is that I needed to do, what it is that I need to change in order to make sure that things go the way that... So what we discovered last week is that the emotion of worry is driven by our devotion. The things that we worry about are the things that we're devoted to. They're the things that, we're, that, that we believe are important. So what's the big deal, right? Who cares? Why can't we just worry about what we want to worry and and, and who cares? Well, Jesus tells us there in verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. What, What Jesus is saying to us is that whatever it is that you've placed your devotion in, that will get in the way of being devoted to him. Whatever that stuff is or whatever that person is or whatever that thing is that you think this is, this is worthy of my worry. Boy, that was hard to say. It's worthy of my worry. Then what you're really saying is that, it's not, that, that God is not worthy of my worship. So the things we worry about, they reveal something about us. Number three, the third thing we learned last week is that everybody thinks that what they worry about is the most important thing anywhere, Right? And whatever anybody else worries about, those are just silly things. <laughs> those are, you guys worry about silly stuff. The stuff I worry about, those are, and here's how I know that. Because last week, whenever you packed up all your stuff and you were walking out the door, and I don't know if you said this or not, but if you did say, you say, you know what? I should probably worry less, right? You kind of walk out the door and you think, I should worry less. I, 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 this week, I'm going to take, take what Lance says and I'm going to do that. So you went home and you started to list out the things that you worry, and you didn't know where to start because they were all important. What what, what are the little things that I can eliminate off my list? See, the thing that we need to understand is that all of us believe that what we worry about is very important. And then the last thing there is that worry does not add to our life. It takes away from our life. As a matter of fact, if we were honest, it is a destroyer not only of us physically, but of joy. Worry takes away your joy. It has been said, someone once said, that worry is prayer in reverse. Instead of going to our Heavenly Father, taking whatever your concern is, whatever it is that you're really worried about, laying it at His feet and saying, Lord, I have done what it is that you have asked me to do. I have, I, I, I've raised the kid. I've filled out the applications, I've, I, I've, I've done, you know, I've, I've saved the money, I've done the things that I'm supposed to do. In other words, it's not, I think sometimes God laughs at us because we go to him and say, oh God, please help me. And he goes, you know, you really haven't done anything on your side. You really haven't, done, there's really not a whole lot of push on your side. But, but, here, here's, here's the thing, to be able to go and lay it at his feet, that's prayer. And then to trust him, worry whenever you hold on to it and say, no, 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 God, you've got to do it my way. So worry is prayer in reverse. Someone else said, worry is, a rocking, is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that, right? Because that's really whenever it comes down to worry, that's what we do. We do a lot of work, a lot of work inside, but we don't get much done. And we hardly ever push it down the road very far. So this week... Somebody else texted me and they, 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 they said, hey, Lance, I wanted to, we, we were down in Astoria and we were at the farmer's market. And while we were there at the farmer's market, there was a band there and they were, you know, using those drums, that, you know, the buckets and like drums and stuff like that. And they were doing all this stuff. And then they had a tip jar. And the tip jar, there was a, a, a picture of a cat. And on the, on the tip jar, it, it, it had this little saying. And she told me what the saying was. And I said, oh, that is so fantastic. I wish you'd have taken a picture of it. So she sent me the picture. So let, let's take a look at the picture here. Don't you love that? Worry is a misuse of, of imagination. <laughs> there is, that is so true to take the gift of imagination, the gift that God has given you in order to make things better, in order to, to really begin to say, bring hope into your life, to take that gift and to worry about things or to think about things or to fret over things that probably will never happen is using your imagination in the wrong way. It's using it in a way that God would have never, ever, ever wanted you to do it. 
American Institute of, of Stress, which I didn't know there was an American Institute of Stress. Did you know that there was an American Institute of Stress? It stresses me out that my tax dollars have to go to the American Institute of Stress to tell me how stressed out I am. So 70 to 90% of doctor's visits are stress-related. Did you get that? 70 to 90% of, of doctor's visits are stress-related. The American Psychological Association says... Stress or worry eats away at the physical body. It lowers the immune system, negatively affects the quality of life, and ultimately shortens life expectancy. Worry is a silent, slow killer. When I was eight years old, <clears throat> we, uh, I, many of you know that, that we, growing up in Texas, we, we lived on little airports. And, and part of what my dad did, he was an airplane mechanic. And, and he worked a lot on crop dusters. You know who crop dusters are those things, you know, kind of, of course, they're not as big nowadays because you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, you know, they, they'd come in and they'd spray poison on all the crop in order to kill all the bugs so that we have good food. Poisonous, but good. And... <clears throat> And these guys were incredible. You know, they kind of fly underneath the, the, the power lines and everything else. Just incredible stuff. But, you know, their, their planes would break down. So there were times that my dad had to work on those. And that's kind of what he did. And we lived on the airport, and his job was to work on those, those airplanes. Well, during this time, they, they had those buckets or big five-gallon drums of that poison off to the side of the hangar. And, and it just happened to be that they had one of those drums had a leak. And, and we had a, a German shepherd. His name was Eric, good name, and, 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 and Eric made his way around the side of the hangar on this particular day, and, and there was this poison that had leaked out, so there was a little puddle of poison, and he decided that he was going to try to drink it, so he drank a little bit of it, and it was kind of sweet to the taste, it kind of had a good taste to it, so he continued to drink it, and he died that evening, and that's what worry does to you, that's what the American Psychological Association says is that worry takes away your life. It is the slow, silent killer. You don't realize it, but it's taking your life away. So worry does just that. And the problem, <clears throat> or what, what, what Jesus told us last week is that worry shows how little faith we really have. There's a correlation between the size of our faith and the size of our worry. If you have big worries, then you have little faith. Big worries, little faith. Now, I'm going to be honest that really stressed me out this week as I started looking at the things that I, that I worry about and, and, and how often I will spend some time really just concentrating on things. And I go, oh, man. And it really brought me to the place where it brought me to my knees to where I was saying, God, I am so sorry. I am taking something that actually is only in your hands. Only you can handle this. Only you can do this. And I'm owning it as if I can do something, as if I'm powerful enough to do this. And I am not powerful enough to do this. So the problem isn't that we're worriers. The problem is that we have little faith and we fail to do the things that we're supposed to do because that's what Jesus says, right? Jesus says, listen, the, the, the birds of the air, they don't, they don't toil, they don't, spit, or they, 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 don't, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't do any of the things that you do and yet your heavenly father takes care of them. So he's not saying don't do stuff. He's saying do stuff, but don't worry about it. So today, today, let, let, let's go ahead and I want to go to the next phase, and that's verse 31. We're going to pick up in verse 31. Jesus says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? And what shall we wear? Now, last week, we talked about the fact that these are worry points, right? At that time, in, in that culture, those were things that were really stressful. They, they were big. Today, if he were talking to us, he would say, don't worry about your retirement. Don't worry about your job. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your relationships. Don't worry about your kid's future. And he's not saying that those things are not important. What he's saying is do not allow those things to stress you out. And then he really kind of puts the knife in and twists it a little bit. Verse 32, he says, for the pagans run after these things. Now, Jesus, that's not very fair. We don't need to resort, resort to, to name calling here. Pagans, really? You know what a pagan is? See, a pagan is somebody that does not believe that there is a God, at least does not believe that there is a personal God that knows your name and answers prayer. A pagan might actually say, well, there's a God, but it's not your God, it's just this God. But to really believe that there is a God that knows your name and answers prayer is to believe that that God knows you and has a plan. And Jesus looks at you and says, listen, if you're worrying all the time, then you're acting just like the pagans are acting. See, our faith is what sets us apart from those without faith. 
It's not that we don't have the same concerns, because we have the same concerns. Please don't hear me say that. I'm not saying that to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ means that you're some sort of superhuman and you walk around numb or without any emotion or without any, you know, we're, we're not all a bunch of Spocks here. But what I am saying is that, is that instead of being worried about things, you can be concerned about situations. You can even be involved in the situation in order to see it come to the place where it's supposed to come to. But to worry about it and to allow that worry to, 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 to destroy you and to paralyze you, that's the wrong thing. That's what those that do not believe there is a God does. How scary is that? Just for me in my life. This week, just taking a look at things, I'm going, oh my goodness, I'm acting like there's no God. I believe that there's a God. I trust that there's a God. I, I know that there's a God. He is active and alive in my life. He's active and alive in my family's life and in, my, in, 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 the, in the church where I serve. I see it in you guys' life. I have opportunities to go and to see God work and to do amazing things. And I praise him. And, and, and you guys ask for prayer. And I pray. And then you guys get back to me and say, you know what? God did this. Praise God. This is wonderful stuff. God is so active. And yet here I am with my little thing saying, God, you're not big enough. You can't handle my little thing. So he says, for the pagans run after these things. Verse 32, he says, And your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. See, to be a follower of Christ is to believe, to, to have a concern for something, but to not act as though there's no God, but to know that that God knows. He knows. He knows what it is that you need. He knows what it is that you want, what it is that, that, that well, ultimately what it is that you need. How differently would your life be? If you really, really believed that, right? If you just really, in every area of your life, you just believe that God, he, he's, he's big enough, he's strong enough, and he knows. Let, let me ask you this. Let, let, let's, let's, let's put a little picture to this. What if today, in all of your worrying and all of your fretting and all of your struggles and everything else, and some of you have, have already come to me and confessed and said, you know what, I, this, is, this is just tearing me up. I mean, just to go through this message and go through this time and to understand where it is that I stand and to understand the things that I worry about and the things that I stress over and the things that I, I struggle with. It's just really got me torn up. What if, what if in the midst of one of those moments whenever you're so worried, right, you're just wringing your hands and you don't even know you're wringing your hands, right? You're just wringing it and, and, and everything's happening and your mind is working overtime and what you're doing is you're, you're using your imagination in order to create things that probably will never happen. What if in the midst of that situation, God sent an angel? You'd freak out first. But after you got over the freak out of seeing him, what if that angel just said two words? And those two words were, God knows. And then he disappeared. Wouldn't that bring a sense of peace to you? Because isn't it true the reason that you really struggle? Well, the reason you really struggle is because you're afraid it's not going to turn out the way that you want it to turn out. But then, then there's this piece of you that says, does God even see? Does God even care? Does, does God even know what it is that I'm struggling with? Does God even, what, where is God in this situation? And wouldn't it be amazing if he just sent an angel and said he knows? And here's the truth. Here's the truth. The truth is, is that he does know. He does know. He knows about your loneliness. He does. He knows about your housing situation. He does. He knows about your kids, the struggles that they're going through, the decisions they've made, the decisions that they failed to make. He knows about your job situation. He knows about your finances. He knows. You can trust him because he knows. And if he knows, then he has a plan. And your responsibility, your responsibility is to do what it is that you know you're supposed to do. To work hard. To to. to Make the decisions that you're supposed to make, to, to, to put in the applications, to, to show up at work and do exactly what it is that you're supposed to do. What, whatever that is, 
to, to write the letter to the person that you need to write, to, to be kind to the person that really isn't very kind to you and now you're so stressed out about the situation. You're supposed to do what it is that you're supposed to do, but then trust God and allow him to do what it is that only he can do. And then Jesus gives us the solution, right? Because it, really we want, we want to know, well, okay, <laughs> that's cool. Just stop worrying. <laughs> How do I do that? Well, Jesus, Jesus kind of wraps it up. Listen to this. Listen to this. Verse 33, he says, but seek, what's that word? First. Seek first. Uh, let's just stop here for a moment because this is interesting. What Jesus does is he's, he's given us all this stuff and he says, these are the things that the pagans are seeking after. These are the things that others do that do not have faith. But, so in contrast to what it is that you normally do, now seek first. Change your devotion. Because isn't it true, come on, come on, just, just for one moment, be honest with me and just, isn't it true that the reason your life is the way it is is because of the life that you, because of the decisions you've made, because of the things that you're doing? I mean, the reason that you're so stressed out is because you've got such an, an obsession about some situation. And Jesus says, what you need to do is take your devotion to that thing, to that person, to that whatever it is, and I want you to move it over to me. I want you to change your devotion. Listen to what he says. Listen. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, don't put your job first. Don't put your relationships first. Don't put your marriage first. Don't put your schooling first. Don't put your family first but put him first. And we live in a society, we, in American society, somehow, please hear, hear the, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get in trouble, I just know it. I'm gonna get emails. Somehow we have, we have taken, especially family and our marriage, maybe even our job, and, and we've kind of made it to where it's like it's equal with God. So then we think, well, these things are so vitally important that we, we, we've, got to, we've got to worry about them. We've got to focus on them. We've got to make sure. And the truth is what Jesus is saying, no, no, no. If you will seek me, then I will make your marriage better. If you will seek me, then I will make your job better. And, and this isn't a magical, well, I showed up and Jesus was there. It was incredible. It was awesome. But something happens in your heart. Isn't it true? Hasn't there been some of you that have tried this? Some of you that have stepped out and said, you know what? I'm just going to seek him today. Maybe you woke up in the morning and you, you went into your devotion time and you read some, some scripture and then you started to pray and then you went off to work. And, and, and you know, that guy that always irritates you, you just kind of sidestepped them and you kept going. And then finally, you know, within the, the context of life, you started to experience something that you never experienced before because not because the circumstances changed, but because you changed. And what changed in you? It was that you weren't stressed out about the circumstances. Now your eyes were on him, his agenda, his desires. And see, somehow we, this is probably, okay, I, I put one on you guys and said we've kind of equal. The church probably has, has done a terrible, terrible job of making it to where, you know, seeking God's agenda and his, it, it, that's like a spiritual, it's like a religious thing, right? It's like, you got to be out there telling people about Jesus all the time if you're really going to be seeking Jesus. Really, truthfully, to act like God wants you to act is to go into love and to do your job properly. That's what he's looking for. And as you do that, and any time that I did that, it, it, it always opened doors. It always gave me opportunities because people understood. So this is what you do. Yeah, this is what I do. And then all of a sudden I live it. And when you live it, then people go, okay, wait a second. You're somebody that has integrity because your life and, 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 your, and, and, and what you believe, they, they go together. And not everybody has that. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of people do not have that. It's part of what separates us is to be able to live by faith and to trust him and to know that he has everything under control and that we can go ahead and just do what we're supposed to do. And when you do that, then the people around you, they'll be strangely attracted to you. And there may be an opportunity for you to be able to share. But the truth is, seeking first doesn't have to do with how many people you told about Jesus. 
It has to do with how are you living your life so that maybe your words, when you do have a chance to tell, have meaning. Does that make sense? Very, very important. So this is Jesus' invitation for everyone to surrender our lives to him, not just a segment of our lives, not just the areas that you worry about, because some of you this week, you went, okay, I got it. Pinpoint that one right there. I'll give you that one, God, because that one's really stressing me out. But I got this other stuff handled. You stay away from this, right? What he's looking for is for us to surrender all of our lives to him, to give it all to him. Jesus says to seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, to put his agenda, to put his agenda in first and to put yours in second. And when we get to that place and you begin to do that, man, you just, you start to worry less. And not only that, there's a peace, right? A peace that comes with it. Paul talks about that peace in Philippians. He talks about a peace that passes all understanding. I've, I've, I've wrestled with that. What does that mean, a peace that passes all understanding? I've come to the conclusion after living 48 years, I've come to the conclusion that really what he's talking about is that it's that peace that doesn't make any sense because truthfully, I ought to be really stressed out because my circumstances haven't changed a lick. Right? I mean, you look at your life and you go, I really should be stressed out right now. Any other time, I would be so just at the edge of my seat, snapping people's neck off, right? But I'm not. It's a peace that passes all understanding. So Jesus invites us to open our hands and to look at him and say, Lord, I'm surrendering everything. My good marriage, my bad marriage, my good job, my bad job. Good relationships, bad relationships, good finances, bad finances. I'm, re- I, I'm surrendering it all. I am giving it all to you. And any time that you've ever gotten to the p- place, and it's not a one time, right? It's not. It's, like, it's not like, I did it. <laughs> I'm done. Because the truth is, within five seconds, you take it back. But, <laughs> but when you get to that place, and not only do you experience that peace, it, it's, just, it's just this incredible place where, where not worry-free, but worry less. You get to the place where you begin to worry less. And some of you, some of you, you know, you you get there because you go, okay, I'm so tired of the way my life is. Some of you have to get there because circumstances crush you. I've I've been there. I've been in situations where years ago where (laughs) decisions I made just absolutely completely crushed me and lose everything. And it's interesting because whenever you lose everything and you get to that place where you're just looking for anything, right? And you look to God, you go, God, (laughs) okay, I surrender. And I think God kind of looks at you and says, well, you didn't leave me much. (laughs) Okay. But he does his best work in that situation, right? So he invites you, just open your hands. Give it to him. Trust him. Do your part, but trust him. Trust him. And some of you are sitting there going, but Lance, that sounds, that, that just scares, scares me to death. Here's the good news. There are other options. You can always worry. <laughs> it's worked for you now. So if you just want to keep doing that, that's cool. But Jesus says that if you want to stop worrying, then seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And look at this, verse 33. And all these things will be given to you as well. What are those things? He's talking about those things that you're fretting about. Now, there is a qualification here because it sounds as though, you know what, I'm really worried about my finances. Just give it over to him. Then everything will work out. There's the qualification of you doing your part. And then there's the qualification of, of he's going to do what it is that he's going to do, what it is that he knows you need. So sometimes what he knows you need doesn't match what you think you need. And then when he doesn't give you what you think you need, then we tend to get upset with him. So you need to understand that his promise is that he will give you these things. And then verse 34, I love this. He wraps it up by saying this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Each day has a, each day has enough trouble of its own. I am so thankful that he says that. I love that Jesus is so honest with us, and he says, I mean, in, in 6.33, John chapter 6, verse 33, he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. I love that. You know why I love that? Because there's a lot of people out there that seem to be teaching that, that oh, no, man, if you, if you follow Jesus really close, then trouble goes away. And, and that's not what Jesus has ever promised us. I love the fact that here he says, you know what, tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Why borrow for, from tomorrow? <laughs> let, let, let's face that and trust him tomorrow with that. I love that. Jesus is so honest with us. So worry is not necessarily a worry issue. It's a faith issue. It's a trust issue. And Jesus invites us, will you trust him? Oh, and by the way, just in case you didn't know this, the one he is asking you to trust is the creator of the universe who keeps everything going. I think he can handle your problem. I think he can. So the question is, will you trust him? Will you worry less and trust him more? So here's what I'm going to do. I gave you, gave you all homework last time. Many of you did a fantastic job. I want to give you homework this time. It's not going to be up on the screen, though, so you're going to have to write it down. So let, let me give you this homework. Last week, I had you track your, your worry. This week, I want you to concentrate on the greatness of God. I want you to concentrate on the greatness of God. And really, what I'd love for you to do, and I know there's going to be some of you that you're going to say, I can't memorize, and I get that, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. I want you to memorize a verse, a simple verse, as a matter of fact. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 11. First Chronicles, not Second Chronicles, not the one everyone knows. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 11. Okay, so write that down. First Chronicles, it's in the Old Testament, chapter 29, verse 11. I want, you to, I want you to memorize that, and I want you just to recite it in your brain. And then the last thing I want you to do, would you get busy serving somebody else? It's amazing how whenever you find somebody else that needs some help and you get involved in their life, how your worries, your stresses kind of have a tendency to go down because you're being used of God to help somebody else. So the last thing there is get involved with somebody else. Start helping somebody else this week. Would you do that? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity for us to be here. Thank you, God, for your word. I, Lord, I know that sometimes, sometimes it's probably more a preacher problem than, than a follower problem. But sometimes we make it sound so easy. Just stop worrying. And the truth is, Lord, that's not what you said. You told us to replace our worry with trust, to move our devotion from things and stuff and people to you. And in that process, we begin to worry less. So I pray that, God, you would help us to do that. Help us to trust you. Help us to put you first in all that we do. Please, God. And Lord, whenever we have the tendency to pick it back up, help us just to remind us, no, 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 that doesn't belong to you. Please, God. For Lord, I ask all this in your precious name. Amen. You know, Lance said we need to be willing to uh, to surrender all this song it says we raise our white flag we surrender all to you but now you want to hear something funny about worship the Greek and Hebrew word for worship is shaka which means to be prostrate before God that means down on our knees bowed before God saying God we are giving you all that we are so when we say we love to worship, let's make this our worship. Let's make this our prayer to God. Let's give it all to God today. Let's bow our hearts down. 
Let's raise our white flags. Let's surrender every little thing inside of us so that we are able to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness.
we got one more song left to do. If you guys want to stay and worship with us, awesome. If, if you guys want to go, feel free to go. But as we get ready to do this next song, still along with what Lance was saying, we have no room to worry. God made us in his image. And God only makes beautiful things. We don't have to worry about how we look. We don't have to worry about how we're going to do things because if we seek first God and his righteousness, all these things will be added.
guys are dismissed. Have a good night.